Let me ask you, could you kill an innocent person? We're going to be talking a little bit about the value of human life. And I want to tell you right up front, we're going to be looking at it from a biblical worldview. What does God have to say about the value of human life? You know, as chaos, as, as things happen around our culture, our community, it's, it's valuable to know how would God have us treat one another. Back in 1992, there was a, a book that was penned called Ordinary Men, chronicled the life of 12 individuals, people like you, like me, accountants, bakers, lawyers, preachers, people who they had planned their life in one direction and then the Holocaust happened. And suddenly they were thrown into a police battalion. You know, never before had these men been asked to, to kill somebody. They certainly did not know how to, to shoot a man. In fact, the very first time that they were asked to do so, to, to kill innocent Jews, the book details the fact that many of them, they were throwing up so violently they couldn't get a shot off. Some of them, their arms were shaking so bad they would have to shoot the person multiple times. But here's what the book chronicles. After just a, a few short months of being desensitized, these 12 ordinary men were able to deliver a, a single shot to the back of the neck, just like a professional. Let me ask you, what, what can cause 12 ordinary men to, to shift their mentality in that direction? Leo Alexander, he, he wrote an article, appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine all the way back in 1949. He was on the, the War Council at that time, and in that, he was looking at what caused the Holocaust. And he stated this, he said the beginnings were merely a, a subtle shift in the attitudes of physicians. He said it started basically with the belief that there was such a thing as a life not worthy to be lived. Now think about that for just a moment. Here we are, roughly 70 years ago. Looking back in history, things were rapidly changing in their culture to the point that they looked at certain individuals and they said, you know what? That's not a life worth living. In fact, in 1936, the German Supreme Court, they refused to recognize Jews living in Germany as persons in the legal sense. Now, we look at that in horror today. We think, man, that, that is atrocious. And yet, let me remind you, as we begin our, our study on the value of human life, right now in the womb, it is not considered to be a living person in the United States. The Nazis, they considered the Jews at this time just quote unquote useless eaters. Now, here's the part that I hope you'll really pay attention to. In 1984, Leo Alexander, the, the same man that was on the, the war council that investigated the causes of the Holocaust, he warned that those same lethal attitudes were starting to take roots in this country. If you have a Bible with you, let me encourage you, open it up to the very first chapter, and let's look at, at how God views life, and specifically how God views man. Turn to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, where Moses wrote, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. In fact, in verse 27, he goes on to say, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now think about that for just a minute. What does it mean to be made in the image and likeness of Almighty God? Does that mean that, that God has got Hands like mine or, or, or a cute face like mine? Now, I, I think most of us know that according to Scripture, God is a spirit. 
In fact, the Bible says we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So if God is a spirit, then what part of Brad was created in his image? Plainly put, that, that would be my, my soul, my spirit. And one of the things that I do not want you to miss throughout this entire series, this study, is human beings have a soul that was instilled by God, and it separates us from all the other creatures. As you read in Genesis chapter 1, one of the things you'll notice is God literally, he just spoke the other things into existence. Not so with man. In fact, if you go back and you look at that passage, you'll notice it says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. There are three words right there, us, our, and our, all three plural. You know what that indicates? It, it indicates that there was like a conference of the Godhead before the creation of man. That didn't happen with the, the birds, the fish, the creeping things. And so as we think about human life today, as we look at what's going on all around us, one of the things that we have to do is we have to keep a biblical perspective that man was created in the image and likeness of God. Because otherwise, here's what's going to happen. During times of, of immorality, times of chaos, all of a sudden we lose consistency. We, we lose our anchor, so to speak. It is only God and God alone who can bring you peace and consistency in your life. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6, the Bible says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. And how thankful we should be for that. Because folks, it's on that foundation that we can build our belief system. He doesn't change. Humans... Oh, we vary dramatically. In fact, let, let me give you one real quick example of how inconsistent we can be on the value of human life. Some of you remember July the 20th, 2012, in Aurora, Colorado, there was a, a movie that was premiering called The Dark Knight Rises, a Batman movie. That particular theater decided to, to show it late at night, it was the very first time, and many of you remember on that particular occasion, there was a, a person who walked into the movie theater and began gunning down innocent people. And for literally days, Americans, they surrounded their televisions, they, they asked questions, why did he do it? This was one of those events that, that everybody really had a wake-up call because Lots and lots of people go to movie theaters. And suddenly we felt like we're not safe anymore. And, and after all, this guy, he, he didn't kill just one or two. He killed several people. And yet, 2.28 miles down the road from that particular theater, there's a place called the Mayfair Women's Center. It's basically an abortion clinic, 2.28 miles away, that kills more unborn children every single day than happened that night in the theater. You see, we, we get all in a shape over a movie theater killing, and, and we remain silent over an abortion clinic less than three miles down the road. In fact, let me, let me really tell you what was going on in that particular clinic just to kind of make sure you understand the atrocity there. There was an a affidavit given by Dr. Curtis Stover commenting on the practices of one of the physicians in that clinic. Listen to what he said. Quote, babies were, he was grinding babies, buckets full of them, 15 to 22 week gestation babies through a hand-cranked old-fashioned meat grinder until they took the consistency of multiple tubes of pink toothpaste able to be flushed down the sink drains. 
You see, when God is not your anchor, there's inconsistency. A pregnant lady, if she's walking down the street, she's on the sidewalk, and maybe, maybe somebody's driving right near her. They reach down, they, they start texting, or they, they mess with the radio. They veer off, and they strike her. You know, in most states, that person can actually be charged with two homicides, killing two people, the woman and the child inside of them. Now, let, let's rewind that for just a moment. She's walking down the same exact sidewalk. The person's still messing with things in the car. They veer up, but right before they veer off the road, she steps into an abortion clinic. Two go in, one comes out. And yet, it's not a crime? Folks, do you see the inconsistency? When you take God's word and his precepts out of the equation of the value of life, everything is messed up. I want to read to you a quote from Noel Webster, one of the founding fathers of our country, talking about morality, talking about scripture. Listen to what he said. The moral principles and the precepts contained in scriptures ought to form the basis of all our civil laws. He said the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. In other words, you set this thing aside and all kinds of chaos is going to ensue. You know, during times of crisis, whether it be a, a coronavirus, whether it be a, a tornado event, that is when Christians have to go back and make sure we're standing on God's word and that we are shining as a light to the community around us. In fact, I want to read to you a, a small portion from a court case, it was the People versus Ruggles, happened many years ago, Supreme Court of New York. Listen to what they said, talking about the good of Christianity. They said, whatever strikes at the root of Christianity tends manifestly to the dissolution of civil government because it tends to corrupt the morals of the people and to destroy good order. You see, there, there are consequences when you take God out of the equation. Consider for just a moment, wh where do we get our objective for right and wrong if there is no God? Does it originate from man? Or does it originate from God? Let me give you one example of what happens to a, a culture that decides to take God out of the classroom, out of the courtroom, out of the town square. Just one example, I, I could give you several. There's an article that was written in the Journal of Medical Ethics just a few short years ago. And, and let me tell you right up front, this is one of those articles that I honestly, I, I didn't think I would live long enough to see. The title of the article, is after birth abortion, why should the baby live? Listen carefully to what these authors are arguing. They say abortion is largely accepted even for reasons that do not have anything to do with the fetus's health. By showing that, number one, both fetuses and newborns do not have the same moral status as actual persons. Two, the fact that both are potential persons is morally irrelevant. And three, that adoption is not always in the best interest of actual people. The authors argue that what we call afterbirth abortion, that is killing a newborn, should be permissible in all the cases where abortion is, including cases where the newborn is not disabled. Did you hear what I'm saying? They're talking about killing a child after it's born. In fact, in this science journal, they go on to say merely being a human is not in and of itself a reason for ascribing somebody a right to life. We have totally forgotten that we were created 
in the image and likeness of Almighty God. Listen to just how far they'll justify this behavior. They say this, actual people's well-being could be threatened by the new, even if healthy child requiring energy, money, and care, which the family might be in short supply of. Now, folks, not to make light of this in any way, my wife and I, we, we've been blessed with four children. Energy it is not something that we have a great deal of at our house at 930 at night. Okay, My children, they usually still have plenty of energy. My wife and I, not so much. But we would not dare think to do what these people are, are talking about. I fear that our country, that, that our nation has forgotten, number one, that there is a God and there are things that he hates. Flip over in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 6. Look at verse 16. Should be a, a familiar passage to many of you. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Notice what they are. First one, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Let me ask you, what, what could be more innocent than the blood of an unborn child? You see, we, we now have a culture that is looking at children not as a blessing, but rather as a, a parasitic burden on society. And for those of you out there who are thinking, well, you know, he, he's just being an alarmist. This, this will never happen. Please understand, Planned Parenthood is already showing videos to college students. They're desensitizing them. Do you remember the book I mentioned to begin with, 12 Ordinary Men That Were Desensitized? That's what we've got going on today. Add to that what they see in textbooks. Textbooks like this one put out by Arms and Camp. Notice what's highlighted. It says, by seven months, the fetus looks from the outside like a tiny normal baby. But it's not. Let, let me ask you, why would we be teaching high school students that a seven-month-old in the womb is not a human child? I mean, think about it. In, in most places, seven months is viable. And yet, our children are learning otherwise. By the way, consider for just a moment what I call the evil of marketing. If you look at the textbook and you look at the picture they put right beside it, any lady that has ever given birth will quickly tell you it's not a seven-month-old in the womb. Because by seven months, that child is doing aerobics in the womb. And yet, if they can get our young people to associate that picture with that statement, number one, it devalues human life. And number two, it makes abortion a whole lot easier. You remember I, I mentioned the article in Journal of Medical Ethics? Let's switch gears for just a moment and, and let's talk some about the elderly. Because in crisis, in, in times of chaos, oftentimes they're the ones who maybe are neglected. Or they're the ones who the medical profession looks at and says, you know what, they've lived a good enough life, we're going to go ahead and let them go. Right now in Italy, coronavirus is going crazy and, and many of the doctors are looking at all their patients and they've decided, you know what, anybody over this certain age, realistically, they, they don't need treatments. Back to that journal of medical ethics for just a moment. Same journal, different article this time. An article titled, What Makes Killing Wrong? The authors of this particular article, they say, this account implies that it's not even pro tanto morally wrong to kill patients who are universally and irreversibly disabled because they have no abilities to lose. In fact, let me give you the, the closing statements that these authors make. 
They said, we'll close with one application to show that our approach makes a difference to medical practice. Traditional medical ethics embrace the norm that doctors and other healthcare professionals must not kill their patients. This norm is often seen as absolute and universal. In contrast, we have argued that killing by itself is not morally wrong, although it is still morally wrong to cause total disability. In their mind, if you don't have anything to offer society, the culture, it's not wrong to go on and take your life, to end your life. Francis Schaeffer, Everett Koop wrote a book titled, Whatever Happened to the Human Race, in which they made this statement. They said, will a society which has assumed the right to kill infants in the womb because they're unwanted, imperfect, or merely inconvenient, Will they have difficulty in assuming the right to kill other human beings, especially older adults who are judged unwanted, deemed imperfect physically or, or mentally, or considered a possible social nuisance? And we're not real consistent sometimes when it comes to the value of elderly human life. Yeah, Christians, we, well, a lot of times we're, we're violently opposed to abortion, but what about the other end of the spectrum? Let's talk for just a moment about the elderly. The Bible, God charges his people, whether that be Christians of today, uh, the Israelites of Old Testament era, to not just cast old people aside, but to benevolently care for them. Think about the parable of the Samaritan. That the question was asked, who's my neighbor? And you remember, two folks walk right on by, look at him, don't take care of him. We are charged to take care of the handicapped, the aged, the poor, and not just kill them. In fact, turn in your Bible to Leviticus chapter 19. Look with me at verse 32. Old Testament passage talking about how we should treat the elderly. It says, you shall rise before the gray-headed, honor the presence of an old man, and fear your God. I am the Lord. We then flip over to Psalm chapter 71, verse 9, where the inspired psalmist said this. He said, do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. Flip over to the New Testament, to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20, verse 35. We, we find Paul here admonishing the people. He says this, I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Did you get all that? Don't cast me off in the time of my old age. Support the weak. Honor the gray-headed. You know, over and over again, what we see is the Bible pointing out that we are to care, to take care of these individuals. In fact, flip over to Amos chapter 2, Old Testament passage that basically points out God's wrath for people who don't do what we're talking about. Amos chapter 2, look with me starting in verse 6. The text says, I will not turn away its punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pan after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, and they pervert the way of the humble. Again, God reminding us here, we are to take care of those who are less fortunate than we are. Galatians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says, They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do, said Paul. Does the Bible talk about old people? Absolutely. Multiple occasions. In fact, there's a description given in the book of Ecclesiastes that, that many people read and sometimes they kind of skip over because they don't realize the hidden 
picture beneath the words. Take a look, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, starting in verse 3. It says, In the day when the keepers of the house tremble, the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets, the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird, all of the daughters of music are brought low. Also, they're afraid of height and terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, when the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails, for man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Did you see what the, the author is saying there, what Solomon is writing about? Go back and look at that passage for just a moment. He, he talks about when the keepers of the house tremble. You know, one of the, the things that a lot of elderly people find themselves doing is they start shaking and not able to control it. My background is I have a, a doctorate in anatomy and neurobiology, studied Parkinson's quite a bit, Alzheimer's quite a bit. And one of the things that Parkinson's patients have is a, a, a tremble. But he goes on to say, strong men bow down. If I were to ask you what does a, an elderly person oftentimes look like, do you know they're kind of hunched over? It says, when the grinders cease because they're few. It's talking about teeth. Those that look through the window grow dim. Most folks know that as you age, the, the lenses of your eyes become cloudy. You get what we call cataracts. It says, when the doors are shut in the streets, the sound of grinding is low. How many times have you gotten out of bed and, and you hear that pop, the, the, the sound? It says, when one rises up at the sound of a bird, one of the things that elderly people oftentimes have trouble doing is sleeping. And so they're up very early in the morning. It says they're afraid of height. They don't want to fall and break a hip. Let's look at one more passage together, and I hope this one will, will encourage you about how you really treat the elderly, how you think about maybe your own parents. Flip over to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And I'm going to read verses 3 and 4 and verse 8. We usually use verse 8 talking about how somebody should care for his family. We, we kind of pull it out of context. I'm going to drop it back in the context of what Paul's actually saying. It says, Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents for this is good and acceptable before God. He goes on to say, But if anyone does not provide for his own, especially of those of his household, he is denied the faith, and he's worse than an unbeliever. And a lot of times we use that last part when we talk about, you know, taking care of your family. In context, what he's actually talking about is caring for your elderly widowed parents. You know, the assumption is already made that you're going to care for your family. But how about the elderly parents? Please hear me when I say this. I understand that there are times when 24-hour care is needed. In fact, my own family, we've had to make some, some really difficult decisions in the past about assisted living or about care facilities. That, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, is it possible that occasionally we put people in homes because we're afraid they'll slow us down? We're afraid that, that maybe that will impede our, our normal lifestyle. Is it any surprise to you that more and more elderly people are taking their own lives as they feel like they've become a burden? Friends, this is what happens when we lose sight of the fact that God has to be our standard. Because after all, humans, mankind, young and old alike, we are just...
As a nation, what we have to do during times of chaos, during times of, of immorality, we got to turn back and we have to uphold the sanctity of human life. We have to remind people that man is different, that we were created in the image and likeness of God, that we do have a soul. I started this lesson by asking you if you could kill an innocent person. And I suspect as you were listening to that, most of you were thinking, absolutely not, I couldn't. And yet I want to draw, as we come to a close, your attention to Jesus Christ. An innocent man that you put on a cross with your sins. It is my hope, my prayer, that you will think about that gift of Calvary and that you'll study, that you'll meditate on what the value of human life really is. Appreciate very, very much your attention. Thank you.